Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Appreciate it. Um, I've missed not doing my job here. We got a couple other shout outs. Richard Penn from the United Kingdom has joined us at the symposium. Thank you, Richard. And Ike Eastburn has joined us, state champion, Cheyenne Mountain Lacrosse. And our final panelist, Dam Gardner. Dam is in his ninth season supporting Team USA as a strength and conditioning coach, working with medalists from the London, Sochi, and Rio Olympic and Paralympic Games. He's also been an athletic development coach for the Golden State Warriors. And uh, this is why Sam's not going to be invited to our employee basketball games. From Westfield State University, he was a four-year member of the men's basketball team and the team captain. Sam, welcome. Before I begin, I just want to thank everyone who put a lot of time and effort into making this event happen. I want to thank you all who are attending for listening. Uh, today, I'll be providing a general broad stroke overview of how I see and address injury prevention within our strength and conditioning program for U.S. Paralympic sport. Let's kick this uh, presentation off with a bit of a think session. Uh, please play along if you can in the comfort of your own home. Let's, uh, let's just throw out a, a theoretical situation here. Say you're working with an able-bodied triathlete. We'll pick on the bronze medal stand for this scenario. Um, let's just pretend all things considered, uh, training age, training response, training history, were all equal. Um, let's say you were used to working with an able-bodied athlete on the left, and one day was tasked with supporting the same athlete in the bronze medal stand in this scenario on the right. Uh, this athlete having a traumatic injury resulting in above in the amputation. What might you consider when thinking about injury prevention? Maybe you're thinking about uh, the difference in energy expenditure. Maybe you're thinking about how half the proprioceptive abilities of the foot are, are missing now. Maybe you're thinking about the overloading of the biological limb. Maybe you're thinking of specific considerations for the shoulder. Uh, now that they can't use their legs, are they going to overuse their shoulder or actually load the shoulders in a different manner in the swim? And let's do the same thing for, for a second scenario here. Say you're working with a, a long jumper, maybe supporting as an assistant SNC with, with this particular jumper on the left. And one day you were tasked with working this jumper on the right, who's in the T11 category, uh, complete visual impairment. What are some of the things you might consider that might be important when considering injury prevention with working with a second athlete versus the one on the left? Uh, maybe you're thinking of your communication skills, your cueing. Maybe you're thinking of your the benefits of tactile learning. Maybe you're considering uh, the balance and proprioception ability that might be necessary for an athlete with visual impairment or setting up a safe training environment. With these last two examples, do you think there would be more differences or similarities and your work with these two athletes. In its simplest form, these are the two main objectives when supporting athletes for me and the staff that I work with. Ideally, we wanna identify key risk factors and try to reduce the severity and incidence for potential injury. We'd also wanna identify key performance indicators and attempt to support consistency and performance within them. Injury prevention and athletic development or sport performance go hand in hand. And if you do your homework, whether they have two legs or don't, whether they have afferent neural response or not, whether they can see or not, it's probably gonna be pretty much the same process. This is an overview of a modified system I've used for several years when providing SNC support to athletes of various sports. Uh, it's been an evolving system, and one of the unfortunate to now have help from three other coaches, and together we utilize some of these principles for 10 different resident and rotational programs that utilize our training sites in Chula Vista and our training center in Colorado Springs. So the first step in our process is to go through a sporting demands analysis profile. When considering injury prevention, it is important to understand the demands being placed on the athlete, understanding the velocities, the forces, the joint angles that the athlete has to experience in training, as well as competition. Uh, that should be a good starting point for us to understand what is going to be demanded of the athlete. Uh, when I transitioned from California back to Colorado Springs, I began working with uh, several sports that I had never worked with before. It was imperative that I dug through the literature, to help better understand the sport, but also meet with the program director and the head coach as often as possible to pick up on their expertise. Something as simple as showing up to training and, and learning about the sport, the culture, the lingo, and witnessing firsthand the demands, I think is imperative. Um, understanding something as simple as the unique demands for let's say a C3 athlete starting the kilo with one limb versus let's say a C4 athlete and a kilo start with two limbs, one of which is a prosthesis. And then the unique considerations of working with a C5 athlete with an upper body impairment. Working together as a collective staff to optimize technique while attempting to reduce the insults to basic biomechanical principles, 
by playing to the athlete's strengths and minimizing their weaknesses can go a long way to help with injury prevention, in my opinion. Okay, step two, having an elite athlete health profile or medical screen, I think is imperative as well. Try to answer questions like, what is the most prevalent injury in the sporting population? And what injury causes the most time loss to training and competition? What is the athlete's individual injury history? And what are the specific impairments or disability profiles of that athlete? All, this, all of this information helps us to identify potential risk factors that our coaches might want to be aware of before working with an athlete. Uh, then looking at population norms, taking uh, literature or experiences from working with, let's say, able-bodied sprinters and runners in track and field. Uh, over time, we might see that internal range of motion at the hip decreases throughout the longevity of their career. Whereas in parasport, we actually see the exact opposite, external range of motion due to gait and uh, specific considerations of gait with para populations decreases and internal hip range of motion might not be as, as strong of a consideration. So making sure you break down the sport within Paralympics, I think is important to make sure that you don't make false assumptions by just comparing them to the able body counterparts. So step three, the trainability assessment. Uh, taking the framework from the AAA or the PCA, uh, we've actually kind of recreated our own movement screen. Obviously not one movement screen might be off the shelf ready for these four different athletes pictured here as a visual. Um, for us, it's imperative that we identify what can an athlete do before we start training? How does the athlete move? Uh, working with parapops and new athletes whom you sometimes have never seen move before, I think it's critical to design an assessment to identify what athletes can do so we can spend less time worrying about what they can't do. We can then use the objective information we gather from areas like active range of motion, grip strength, pushing versus pulling strength, along with the subjective information we gather around uh, squatting technique or landing technique as examples. And we as a staff can start to better understand where we're going to start with our initial program for the athlete. We can then track the athlete to themselves over time and see if there's any improvement. We can also compare them to their sporting mates uh, to see what potential movement strategies and efficiencies might be most common. Uh, we can even compare them to other sporting mates in different sports with similar impairment or disability profiles and see is there a common trend that we might want to identify in the future or help us uh, get better at our actual craft. All this information can now be overlaid with our EHP information or our medical screening information so we can paint a more specific picture for the individual's unique considerations and hopefully have deeper conversations amongst our medical and performance staff around the athlete, keeping them at the center of the puzzle. Now that we've learned a little bit about the sporting demands, uh, we have some medical screening information, we have a trainability assessment in place and movement information for the specific athletes, we can start to worry about getting to work uh, and actually putting the plan in place. In the simplest terms, we progress in the following manner. Uh, we go from general, unloaded, slow, and simple movements, and we progress athletes when appropriate over time to more specific, more loaded, faster, more complex movements. Uh, if you don't have a logical training progression in place, uh, good luck with the whole idea of injury prevention. Again, in general, in its simplest terms, uh, we look to provide a balanced stimulus in the weight room. We do squat with ambulatory athletes, but we don't force any one specific squat on all the athletes we work with. We do like to learn how to hinge. Uh, here's an example of a male double below the knee amputee athlete pulling off the pins and a female double above the knee amputee uh, using support while going through a hinging pattern progression. We do like to do single leg stance work. Here's an athlete with complete drop foot who was told he'd never be able to balance on one leg, uh, performing a single leg body weight squat with external load for multiple reps. Uh, we do push, but we spend more time pulling, especially with our seated populations. Again, if we're considering injury prevention within our programming, if an athlete's constantly pushing in their day-to-day -day operations and locomotion, uh, we wanna try to offset that as much as we can with loading in the weight room. We do brace and rotate, and sometimes with athletes, let's say with SCI, we might have to get a little more creative with how we perform those duties. And we teach landing before we teach jumping progressions, especially with our visually impaired athlete population. The classification system with the training means can help you as the uh, support staff member and the sport coach have deeper conversations and make sure you're actually working towards a unified goal. Uh, it's imperative to be working together and keeping the athlete at the center of the performance puzzle versus pushing and pulling in opposite directions while the athlete doesn't benefit from either of your work. Uh, general preparatory exercise could be something as simple as this rollout progression here, demonstrated by a T13 athlete with visual impairment. A specific preparatory exercise, something like a 
power clean here demonstrated by the same athlete. Maybe uh, from the sport, you actually identify getting your hips through in a jump as a specific preparatory exercise. Maybe you want to work on a subcomponent of the competition exercise, like placing an athlete in a safe environment where they feel comfortable expressing optimal force output and hopefully having some fun in the process of doing so. And then seeing how all, all this works together to support the athlete in the competition when it matters most. This is how he did it. Isaac Jean-Paul already had the world record. Wow. That was a few moments that ago. That would be seven centimeters coming into this if he can clear it from his previous world record. Oh, he's done it! That is a jump and a half of wobble and moved. All this is good and well, but let's not forget something as simple as, as program attendance. Uh, let's not forget the importance of consistency. Can we get athletes to show up? Can we get athletes to show up on time? Can we get athletes to show up on time with the intent to get better every single session? Uh, if you don't have that in place, uh, you're probably just going to be monitoring a program that, that's not going to be very useful, and I'm not really sure that's going to help you with injury prevention in the long run. So now that we've gone through those first three steps, we've got a program in place, then we can start worrying about athletic assessments or monitoring the, the actual response of those programs. I think uh, too often coaches jump to wanting to worry about monitoring, they want to worry about testing before they've actually done their homework to put a program in place that's most appropriate for the individual athlete. Something as simple as a counter movement jump uh, can feed into four different buckets to tie multiple staff members together uh, to hopefully work with the athlete and keep them at the center of the performance puzzle. Again, moving from the lab to specific training, if we can work together, hopefully we can get more information out of the training sessions and competition sessions and not have to always rely on testing in a lab setting. So here's one example of a swim athlete performing an athletic assessment, in this case scenario, a counter movement jump. Uh, this particular athlete was having some severe knee issues. Uh, Using the counter movement jump, we were able to actually have an assessment point in place to better communicate between the sports medicine staff and performance staff. On the bottom right of this chart or report, um, you can see that we use the KAI. Uh, shout out to Dr. Jordan, who's also on this presentation panel today. As an anchor point for us as a staff to focus on and hopefully have deeper conversations around this individual. Uh, in her first assessment, she demonstrated over 30% bias in her concentric abilities. Over time, we were able to close that window down to within a 5% discrepancy. And the athlete was then able to get back to swimming in the breaststroke event in the pool and has since broke two world records in that event for a classification. Here's another quick example, this time from a road cycling athlete. Uh, when the athlete first came to town, they were reporting a 70-30 split uh, of watts on their right crank being 70 and the left crank being 30. As training accumulated, uh, they were reporting significant hip pain and their, their ratio actually got as high as 80-20. Uh, we started to use uh, objective measurements to quantify our unilateral strength training approach and with the intention to create some more symmetry in our bilateral deficit scores and isometric strength tests. The athlete was then able to go to nationals and keep under a 60-40 split through the most critical race moments of the competition. They were also able to report no hip pain after that competition. And three weeks later, they went on to represent USA and the world team and come back with hardware with medals around her neck. And then just to tie it all together, the, the concept of reducing common risk factors while trying to enhance uh, common performance metrics that have been identified as critical for that athlete. Uh, the whole idea of injury prevention, athletic development, or, or strength and conditioning being one and the same. Uh, it doesn't have to be two separate roles. It doesn't have to be two separate programs. It can all just hopefully be blended together to keep the athlete's uh, best interests at heart. Um, working together with other professionals, I'm lucky to work with Liz Broad here on the left. We have a, an example of uh, anthropometric profiles for athletes. All that goes into consideration as well. Obviously, body composition and, and uh, lean mass indexes are critical. Uh, keeping athletes healthy and safe, along with looking at their performance metrics and making sure that we're hopefully producing the most, the, the most uh, potential force at the right body weight for something like cycling. Uh, and then here on the right, we have a final example of an athlete's kind of overview as we monitor the process of their training. You know, here we kind of saw that the athlete was dropping below 80 percent of their actual uh, prescribed training. Um, and that allowed us to, to start an intervention, 
jump in place just in time for competition season and make sure that they were getting back to all the training sessions. Sometimes removing some work from an athlete's program because you didn't have it right as a coach uh, is the best way to help keep them safe and healthy. Uh, in closing, in these unique times, our, our new standard, our new normal, uh, I'm reminded of Albert Hubbard's quote, don't take life too seriously. You're, you'll never get out of it alive. Um, I hope everybody out there is, is staying safe, staying healthy, and I appreciate all of your time and attention today.